thank you all for being here. Uh, this week, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and Cultural DC thought the perfect way to celebrate would be to explore some of the ideas introduced this season uh, by artist Andy Yoder in his uh, exhibition, Overboard. Overboard was scheduled to open in Cultural DC's Mobile Art Gallery earlier this month. And while we look forward to installing the gallery exhibit in the future, we're excited to start exploring the work now. Just a little bit about his exhibit for those of you that don't know or haven't had a, check, a chance to check it out on our website. Andy's project, Overboard, is inspired by the Great Shoe Spill of 1990. Uh, this is when five shipping containers fell off a, a ship in the ocean. The containers held uh, 80,000 pairs of Nike sneakers, and over time those sneakers floated to the surface and started washing up on shore. Uh, and oceanographer Curtis Evesmeyer track, used, tracked the sneakers as they washed ashore along the coasts of Oregon and Washington, and was able to use this data along with the data from beachcombers to monitor ocean currents and follow the path of that the sneakers took across the ocean. Um, so Andy's installation kind of uses this incident along with the sneakerhead subculture to bring attention to the impact of consumer culture on the planet's environment. Today, Cultural DC has put together an all-star panel uh, to explore some of the ways art, policy, and individuals interact with the environment, sustainability, and the damage inflicted on the planet. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce our moderator, Hunter Schwartz. Uh, Hunter is a political reporter and the author of Yellow, an email newsletter about the culture, branding, and visual rhetor rhetoric of American politics. Uh, he has worked as a reporter for outlets including CNN, The Washington Post, and BuzzFeed. He previously co-wrote two newsletters about politics and pop culture, Coverline and The Political Edit. Welcome, Hunter. Welcome, everybody. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so I'm excited to be here. Um, we have three great panelists with us. First is Andy Yoder. Um, Andy is a graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art and he attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Andy uses domestic objects as the common denominators of our personal environment. Altering them is a way of questioning the attitudes, fears, and unwritten rules which have formed that environment and our behavior with it, with it, within it. Hi, Andy. Welcome. Hi there. You're, you're, right, you're in your studio right now with some of those shoes behind you. I am, yep. These are how, um, the sneakers, yep. How many, how many have you made now? What do you, what's, uh, what's your count? I, my count is up to 240 of these things. Um, there's quite, there's quite, a, quite a few. They go floor to ceiling here in the studio. And by the time they get to the Brattleboro Museum after Cultural DC show, there'll be over 300 of them. Um, they're all made out of uh, reclaimed packaging that I've, most of which I've gotten from the recycling bins. So it's sort of a, a good metaphor. <laughs> our, our next panelist is Jonathan Black. Jonathan is a senior policy advisor for U.S. Senator Tom Udall, New Mexico, working on plastic pollution and environmental issues. In February 2020, he helped the Senator unveil the biggest plastic waste legislation in history the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2020. Before his current position, he was senior staff on the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources for over 10 years. Welcome, Jonathan. Great, thanks. Good to see you. Hope everybody is healthy and safe today. And then our third panelist is Maggie Ostall. And Maggie is the Conservation Policy Manager for the National Aquarium coordinating throughout the organization with partners to inspire conservation and advocate for solutions that help people, wildlife, and their habitats. Maggie is an, environ, is an experienced marine conservation professional, having worked in six states and in two countries at the intersection of science-based policy, outreach, and communication around ocean issues, including fisheries, sustainable seafood, plastic pollution, and ecosystem management. Uh, welcome, Maggie. Thanks so much. It's exciting to be here. Hope everyone's and, doing well. And tell me, what what, what is it like? Uh, what what does an aquarium do during a pandemic? What are what are what's going down there? Um, well, uh, like many businesses, uh, we are close to the public for safety and um, to do our part to flatten the curve. Um, we've been 
um, closed down uh, since to close to the public uh, since mid March, and um, we look forward to welcoming people again when it's safe. Um, but in the meantime, we we still have thousands of animals that um, from from small to to large um, on site, and so we do have a core team that are. Um, safely caring for those animals um, around the clock. You know, we offer top-notch care, and um, luckily, many of us are able to do some work remotely to continue mission work and and figure out, you know, um, ways that we can continue to engage the public around conservation and and animal animal welfare. And you know, we've like many like many in our in our circle, we've been offering a lot of on online content that's um, hopefully distracting people a little bit from what's a really challenging time. So um, we're, we're keeping busy and we're excited to welcome people back when it's safe to do, do so. But in the meantime, um, we'll, talk we'll, last, we'll talk uh, recycling and, and why ocean conservation is super important. And you're feeding more uh, eels in your, in your <laughs> living room. Yeah, well, this, as, as mentioned to some of my colleagues earlier, this more eel is not to scale, uh, I would like to point out. Um, but no, we do have some, some fun visual backgrounds that we're able to use. So um, my friend, the more here is is representing since we can't be at the aquarium. Well, I'm excited to talk with you guys tonight. Um, I uh, like, 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 like we talked about earlier, I, I'm a journalist. I cover the intersection of uh, politics and visual culture. And so I did a story this past week about the role that graphic design has played in environmentalism. And I kind of went, went into the story thinking, oh yeah, I'll just kind of look over uh, the history of like public service announcements and things. And what, what, I, what really struck me was how how there's so much more to the story than I thought, how a lot of design and a lot of visual communication is meant to kind of deceive and to make us think that things are doing better, uh, things are going better than they really are. And so I kind of want to start right there and talk about what are, what are some myths around recycling and environmentalism versus what's really going on. So Jonathan, uh, I want to first ask that question to you. What are some of the myths around, around recycling? Yeah, thanks, Andy. I think uh, for me, there there's kind of two big myths. One is, you know, everything is recyclable. And the other is that everything gets recycled. Um, I think recycling is one of the biggest environmental things that we do on a daily basis. Everybody is connected to that. Uh, my wife and I, my family, we all recycle. We sort of recycling every day. We feel like we're doing our part. Uh, but the fact is that it's much cheaper for companies to produce new items from raw virgin materials than it is to get that material back to clean it and then transform it into something uh, again to give it another life. And some of the numbers are pretty staggering. I mean, the United States right now, uh, the data shows that we produce about 35 million tons of plastic waste each year. And only about 3 million of those tons, about 8%, is actually sorted for recycling. The rest either goes to landfills or gets incinerated. And then the sad story is that that 8%, an even smaller fraction, is actually turned into something else. And oftentimes it's downcycled into carpets or clothing or things, not really into products. While a vast majority of that that is sorted for recycling get shipped overseas, oftentimes to really uh, poor countries to deal with. And I think it's kind of interesting. We have Andy's work, and I can't wait to see it here by Cultural DC in a shipping container. And if you think about what's going on right now, we're actually sending about 225 shipping containers of plastic waste to poor countries every day. And unfortunately, that's actually good because historically it was about 4,000 shipping containers that we were sending to China. Mm -hmm. And so that leads to this other myth. It's that this myth that we as consumers are the ones that are, have the power to do things. You know, we've been taught that it's the litter bugs. It's the people that are just throwing stuff away. We need to do more beach cleanups, more highway cleanups. We need to stop that. The fact is we are just producing so much stuff and the amount of unnecessary stuff is being uh, ramped up at unprecedented levels. And so, 
you know, that's really a hard thing to kind of get your head around. And, and I think you probably uh, learned that in all of your investigation this past couple of weeks. Yeah, it, it's kind of surprising, like finding out that, that, that there's some anti-littering campaigns that were basically done by corporations to kind of push off the responsibility. Kind of like you yeah, said, I like think that bit. that really happened, you know, um, as we got more and more with disposable culture, um, you know, things, it's how can you manage all that stuff? It's, it, it ends up racking up and piling up. And so as a result, I think a lot of the big companies, they got together and they got to sort of shift the burden onto the consumers and to say, you know, this is their fault to kind of get away from these backlashes against that product that they were producing because, you know, they need to continue building and producing those products more and more so. Yeah, and Andy, when you were doing research for, for this exhibition, were there any kind of things that, that you learned that really shocked you? Any things that, that were kind of missed that you ended up finding out about or researching? Well, it wasn't a myth. It was just that I, I started looking into shipping containers inspired by the venue where I'm going to show these things. And I, I found out that this, this incident, um, only five shipping containers fell overboard. But um, in an average year, about 1,500 shipping containers fall off ships, you know, during storms at sea. And, and then I started looking into, like, how many shipping containers there are. And there's, like, 36 million of them. At, you know, and that's a low estimate in use. So I thought, well, maybe at this exhibition, I could, I could make these numbers kind of tangible because they're just like these big, scary numbers that leave you feeling kind of depressed or whatever. Um, and I thought, okay, what if I make 1,500 shoes? And it's taken me months to make like 250 shoes. And I think about, well, what if I had to do, um, you know, X number more? The numbers, when you start like seeing like when you're in kindergarten, what you, you collect like five, a hundred marbles to see what a hundred looks like. The, the what 1500 looks like is a lot. And that's just such a small slice of a much bigger picture. So that was the big surprise was what the, what the actual numbers are and what we're talking about in the, in the situation and what our impact is, you know, in, in terms of what we, of the stuff we buy, this is just shoes. You know, that's, that's of course one tiny bit of things that comes from overseas. So it was, um, it was an eye opener for sure. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of other items. I mean, you focused in on shoes, but, but there's been a lot of other items that have washed up on shore. Yeah, there was a the famous uh, Garfield the Cat uh, phones that uh, spilled and, and uh, thousands of phones were washing up on the beach. And also there were rubber ducks, which everybody loved, you know, the little rubber ducks um, <laughs> washing ashore on the beach. But I think we've all been to beaches and, and and seen, you know, like flip flops and plastic bottles and all that stuff. And that probably didn't came from, you know, hundreds of miles away, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty serious situation. Yeah. But I, I feel like, well, you can't just be, you can't just be doom and gloom. So I think maybe the shoes have a value in that they, they open a different window into it. Um, and, and open people's eyes in a little bit different way and maybe actually inject some humor into it as well. So that's, that's, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, another thing I think that plays a big role uh, visually when we talk about environmentalism today is these images, these viral images of animals, whether it's like a turtle with, with the straw on its nose or whales that have been eating a lot of plastic bags. Um, and Maggie, this question is for you. I'm wondering, what is the reality behind those images? Like, is that, are, are these one-off cases or is this something that's really common? Um, well, so unfortunately, yes, it, it is pretty common. Um, you know, those, there are over, at last count, um, the latest data I know of, there are more than 800 species um, globally that have been documented to either have ingested, so, so eaten, swallowed plastic, um, or been entangled by plastic items. Um, it could be, you know, it could be fishing gear, but it, it is often packing straps or, you know, um, tape, uh, various plastic items that have come from land. Um, so the, the reality is it's, it's hard to sugarcoat. It's, it's not good. 
Um, there, there are many species that have been impacted. Many of those species, about 15 uh, percent or so, are endangered or threatened species. Um, so they're already um, having some issues from a population standpoint. Um, and it's not just it's not just animals in the ocean. It's not just the aquatic animals. It's also animals on land. I mean, we know that camels have been found with large clumps of plastic bag in their stomachs uh, because it can blow through the desert. So, um, but, you know, I think Andy's right. Like, I think if, if we focus on just the sheer magnitude and the, the unpleasant, very unpleasant aspects of it, 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 can, it can shut people down. I mean, it, it can seem too overwhelming, but um, one of the things that we really try to focus on are all the solutions that are out there and that are being talked about and more and more people every day are becoming aware of the issue and the fact that um, we need to act collectively. And, and I do think that individual actions matter. A lot of times it's people taking individual action that then really gets them aware of ways that we can act as groups too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that focusing on, on the solutions and the fact that, let's be honest, I mean, 10 years ago, this was not a popular topic in general, this was not in the major media, this was not a mainstream issue per se. There were a lot of people that knew about it and knew what the issue was and knew about plastic pollution, but you know, I think the one of the functions of those very visceral images, the video of the sea turtle, um, uh, Chris Jordan is a photographer that um, has some famous images of albatross. Um, you know, there, there are some very well-known images which, which make people either curious or aware of the problem, but soon after that, there needs to be a menu of solutions so that people can take action. Um, and that's something that we really try to focus on is, is connecting people to solutions in a way that works for them. Well, and with all this focus on animals, I mean, what kind of effect does that have on humans? Like, you know, we, we see these pictures with animals and plastic, but, but what does that mean for, for us? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the reality is, is that we know that plastic, so, when plastic goes into the ocean, and you know, for for perspective, um, there's the estimate is about eight eight, mil eight million metric tons of plastic leak leak from the land um, into the environment off in the ocean um, per year, and that works out to be for a visual about a dump truck of a dump truck per minute of plastic Oof. waste that is going into the ocean, um, and it's coming. It's a global problem. I mean, it's. Per, per capita, the United States still consumes the most plastic, you know, per person per year. Um, so it's important to think of it as wherever it's coming from, it's all of our, it's all of our problem. Therefore, we're all part of the solution. Um, anyway, when plastic goes into the water, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't biodegrade, but it does break down into smaller and smaller pieces. And so you, you start to have a problem of micro, microplastics, which then you know, animals don't realize that they're pieces of plastic rather than um, plankton or, or food. And so they eat them and whether or not it, you know, ultimately is there is the reason for an animal expiring, <laughs> um, there's plastic in their system and, and it, is, it has entered the food chain. So basically we know that plastic pieces and plastic particles are in table salt. We, there's, there's been plastic pieces found in table salt. Um, in fish, what what the science is still unclear on exactly the ways that plastic, if if we eat it in salt or in fish or whatever, it's still we're still trying to figure out what that actually means in our system, like how that affects our system. It's probably not great, but there's still a lot of science going on for exactly how humans can be affected if we consume well when we consume plastic particles. Yeah, I read earlier this week that they even found plastic microfibers in Antarctica. I mean, the most remote place you can think of. Um, so it is, it's getting into our food and our water. And like Maggie says, I mean, we don't necessarily know what those impacts are, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking it's a great thing either. Uh, and Jonathan, how bad do you, is this problem? Like, I know, I know we're, we're going to talk about solutions, but like, if you have to just talk about like, this is how bad it is. This is how bad it's going to get. Like, like, how would you describe that? Yeah, I mean, the numbers are growing exponentially. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, things like plastic uh, have a very valuable and useful place in our society. They've made our cars lighter. We're using for medical devices. Uh, the problem is uh, we are building so many new plastic facilities 
uh, to feed more and more single use items uh, that are really unnecessary. And uh, they're displacing things that were traditionally reusable. Um, and the numbers are growing up staggering. And I think, you know, if you look at those curves, I mean, they just keep going up and up and up. And I don't have the numbers right at my fingertips here. Uh, but from when you looked at when plastic uh, first came onto the scene in the 50s or so, and then moving forward, it's, it's, it's supposed to triple now by, I think, 2050 where we're at. So um, this is a man-made problem. <laughs> it's one that we are uh, compounding uh, annually. And uh, it's one that we really need to, to address head on. Well, Angie, when we spoke, you talked about kind of, you, you wanted to create this visual with this wall of sneakers. And it was, you, you, said, you said you were kind of inspired by walls of, of uh, cereal in grocery stores and kind of this idea of just like a lot of branding, a lot of color in your face. Right. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering what, what do you take from that in terms of the role consumerism plays in, in environmental problems? Well, I think um, personally, I think that we've gotten to this place where we, um, we, we de to consumers demand huge number of choices. So the thing about the cereal aisle is you're looking at this like canyon of color and branding that wants to get your eyes on the product, but there are so many, so many different kinds. And I think just like the, like Jonathan was talking about the plastic, those choices have, have, um, have grown exponentially. And I'm not sure that having more and more and more makes us happier and happier. I don't think it does. So um, I'm kind of playing off that because I'm taking exactly those packages. A lot of these are made out of cereal boxes, but they're made out of, you know, a toothpaste and seaweed and beer and all those other things. And they're taking these commodities and, and rebranding them into the shoes. And it's sort of like a, um, a bit of an echo chamber. So it's making us maybe think about like what that experience is like and, um, and how another thing is how branding um, has become sort of everywhere we look. Um, I think some of the, the biggest examples are like um, in bowl games. It's, you know, it's the Tostito bowl or it's the, uh, it's the Frito-Lay bowl. Um, so consumerism is, has grown as just, it's such a huge part of our culture now. And I don't think it was as big before. So it's sort of a, um, it's sort of a, it's sort of a statement of just how much stuff we, we consume, you know? <laughs> There's a term that my boss is pretty fond of called uh, manufactured obsolescence. And it's this idea that, you know, companies are purposely manufacturing and designing products and parts from inferior materials uh, to ensure that they have a limited lifespan. Uh, you know, you're not going to keep buying things if it's going to last you a long time. I mean, we used to have a society that had and treasured these products that would really last and, you know, you'd pass on these heirlooms and things like that. And certainly there's a place for you know, those things and, and for things that are less uh, st static forever. But uh, I feel like the balance is definitely tipped. And we are, we are in this manufactured obsolescence where things are built to be used, disposed, and replaced. And it goes from furniture to sneakers, to shoes, to, to electronics. I mean, we had a television when I was growing up for years and years and years. Now, you know, you see a TV on the street every week when somebody's replacing their TV with something new. Um, I think it's pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how do you think we fight against that? I mean, that like, like, do you, do you think that legislation could play a role in fighting back against that? Or like what role can consumers play in fighting back against that? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, consumers are definitely valuing um, price rather than, you know, quality or value right now. Um, you know, I think, uh, the, the legislation that my boss introduced, uh, Senator Udall introduced the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, it, uh, it really tries to shift the burden of the waste aspect from the consumers to the companies that are producing them. Because right now those companies are producing and producing and producing. And then it falls on taxpayers, municipalities, and local citizens to fund the collection, disposal, 
and removal of those items. And so these companies are, are really disconnected from that. Um, and so, you know, the bill that my boss introduced really tries to put producer responsibility, thinking about if you're putting a product in, you know, think about its life cycle, how it's collected at the back end. These are things that we're familiar with, you know, battery take back programs, the paint take back programs. Um, these are things that, uh, you know, can actually start to incorporate the cost mm -hmm. of that product's entire life at the beginning so that when a consumer is buying it, they know up front, you know, it's not a hidden cost of, of pollution that's on the other end. Yeah. One thing that I was really struck by doing research was um, how companies, it's this term called greenwashing, where companies pretend to be more environmentally conscious than they really are. Um, and Maggie, I'm wondering if this is something you know about, like the role that the greenwashing plays where people, they know that, they know that, that we want to be environmental. They know that that's a popular topic. And so they kind of pretend to be more environmentally conscious than they are. I mean, Maggie, is, is, that, is, that a, is that a problem that you've seen in your work? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that greenwashing is, I think sometimes it's intentional and often it's unintentional, um, at least for a time. I mean, I think that um, information changes. And so sometimes, you know, there is, there is, an, there is a well-meaning attempt um, and then um, it, I, I don't know, it's hard to say. I mean, some examples of greenwashing, for instance, um, I'm trying to think of a, of, of a really clear cut example. Um, well, so for instance, even terminology sometimes can, can, be, can be quite confusing and lead to greenwashing. So for instance, um, we often refer to things, people often refer to things as being biodegradable. Um, and that's a very confusing term because it's a, it's a process that happens in, in nature, but you know, when applied to a synthetic product of some sort, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of, you know, regulations and, and use and, and uh, marketing and all of those things. And so I think that terminology can, because it can be confusing, can often lead to greenwashing um, and people thinking that they're purchasing something that is better, but it may not actually be better um, when maybe the best step is to think about, well, do, is this something that is best to be purchased or is it, should I be, gearing towards something that is reusable, for instance, rather than, quote, biodegradable. What does that mean? So I think, I think language and terminology really can affect greenwashing. Um, and I think, you know, education, uh, letting people know that choices really matter. And so, you know, whether it's choosing to learn about the issue or choosing to when, when you need to purchase something or when you want to purchase something, you know, how can how can we help people realize that their 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 choices for be it toilet paper be it you know utensils or be it sneakers or whatever it is that they can really matter and you know i don't think anyone's really advocating not to buy things ever again but when you are purchasing something um you know it's important to try to make that purchase count if you value having a cleaner environment one of your articles that I read uh, today, Hunter, talked about the chasing arrow symbol. And so many companies put that chasing arrow symbol on their products. And I know uh, I used to buy all these products thinking, oh, well, it's got the chasing arrow. It's recyclable. And, uh, you know, maybe technically it is recyclable in a lab somewhere. <laughs> um, but the fact is, it's not a product necessarily that's getting recycled. It's either got too many different components or it costs too much to go through the process and be turned into something. And so it's cheaper to just build something from a new virgin product. Um, so I think, you know, consumers are often confronted with these things. And I, I do believe that it is intentional a lot of times on behalf of the company to portray their, their product as recyclable or as Maggie says, you know, biodegradable or compostable or, or all these other different terms. And, and again, I think what our legislation is trying to do, uh, Senator Udall is saying, like, if you're going to make those claims, back it up. 
and actually do something. Make sure that that does get recycled or composted. Make sure you are, you know, investing some dollars into that instead of just the municipality or the local taxpayers that are paying for that. Because it's a very expensive endeavor to collect and sort and move all this trash around. And uh, it's even worse when it's expensive for naught. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that symbol pops up on a lot of things, but but like you said, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily apply. Um, so, Andy, this next question is for you. I'm wondering, what do you think the role that art that art can play in environmentalism is like? Like, what what yeah, what can that do for opening people's eyes and, and awareness and people taking action? I think that's what you just said is is the key. Is that um, what I hope is that like, like what I'm doing and what other artists do are, are taking people and, and giving them an awareness of the problem from a different angle. Cause I think we're, it's easy to get a little bit jaded about, um, from the conventional like, uh, sources of, of the problem. Um, so if you entice people visually and you get them excited, for instance, with these, maybe about sneakers, and then you see the wall text that, guess what? This sneakers are connected to, uh, are based on a real situation in the environment and they represent like X number of a small slice of a much bigger situation. Then I think you've created some space in people's minds to, um, to take another look or have another angle on, on the situation. Um, I think what has to be accompanied that is, um, is some way that they can plug that into action. If you are interested in doing this, then you know you can do this. So it's I think these are like a, a delivery system, but they're they have to be accompanied by something so they aren't just this this little moment that people have and then move on and nothing changes. But I do think they, they can be very, very useful in, in opening in opening people's eyes that might not might not have paid attention otherwise to this issue. Yeah, there's a there's this um, group called Climate Visuals. It's basically an online library, and they put together like photos. You can like search through it if you want photos of you know flooding or fires and find fair use photos. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of look through there because they said that they did some research and they found like a lot of images that that we traditionally associate with climate change, mm -hmm. you know, polar bear smokestacks. The people are kind of tired of those images. Okay, yeah. And I just that like that's something that's you know, and I, I I feel like that was for me growing up. That was a lot of the imagery that I saw. That's just kind of how we talked about the planet was with those kind of images. And so yeah. I do think it's interesting that after after a while, like those just kind of lose their lose their power. Like people see it and they're like, yeah, we've heard this before. Um, so it is kind of like you you kind of need to find new new images and new stories to get people's attention. And keep it up. I think you have to keep it somewhat upbeat because if you're just, if you're feeling like you're being guilt tripped and there's nothing but one depressing image after another, of course you're going to go the opposite direction, I think, or, or walk away. But um, if we can try it from another angle, then I think we have much better chance of, of, of actually getting people to do something. Yeah, Maggie, I have a question for you. Working at an aquarium and kind of having this place where people are able to come and see animals and learn about ecosystems and kind of have this this more hands-on visual experience i mean what what kind of role do you think that plays in opening up people's minds about the environment and environmental problems um well i mean what there's a there's a common a well-known i think quote i i'm not sure who it's attributed to but you know you you protect what you love and you love what you can what you can understand or connect to somehow um i might have added that last part but um I think that one of one of the ways we we're really proud of being able to connect people to to, to amazing wildlife um, that you know maybe they maybe many of those people won't get a chance to see you know um, whale watching is great but not everybody can go on a boat and go whale watching um, or you know um, go to the beach um, as often as they might like to or you know, go swimming in the ocean. I mean, those are all experiences that many of us are fortunate to have, but there are a lot of people that, that can't actually go and experience, you know, wildlife 
some of the wildlife that, you know, some of the ambassador animals that we have at the aquarium, we also like to connect people to the wildlife that's right in their backyard. Um, we do a lot of programs with, um, with uh, we, we work a lot with communities throughout Baltimore to really emphasize that there's, you know, there's the global and there's the local. And so um, whether it's coming and seeing, you know, a macaw that's a species that you would find in an Amazon rainforest or, you know, seeing um, some ter terrapins that, you know, are local to the state of Maryland. I, I think that it's a great way for people to connect to, you know, interesting animals and, and representative ecosystems and, and remind us that there's a lot of, there's a lot of really amazing creatures out there. Um, and they're still there, you know, yeah, there's a lot of challenges and there's been, there's been loss of biodiversity and there's, you know, habitat destruction and, and all of the problems that we face. At the end of the day, there's still a lot to be really excited about. And there's, you know, nature is resilient if you let it be resilient. Um, and so it, it's, it's fun to just t hear people marveling at a shark, whether they've seen it one time for the first time or a hundred times. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times where I've been walking, you know, from one meeting to another and my, my role when in normal times in, in, in times when we're open to the public, my role is, is behind the scenes. And so I, I don't get to engage on a daily basis with everybody that's visiting, but um, I do get to walk through the aquarium when we're open and it's, and it someday when it's safe again to do so. Um, and it's one of my favorite things is to hear, um, is to hear a young person sort of, use their outdoor voices indoors and yell about the shark or um the the angelfish or nemo or yeah you know, i mean <laughs> it's just exciting to to hear people being excited about animals that we all love um and so i think that being able to connect people um and right now we're we're trying to do that even though we can't welcome people into the building you know, we're trying to do that with with live webcams. You can go to our website and um, watch watch a live cam from some of our from some of our exhibits any time of the day or night, um, because sometimes it's just nice to watch jellies in their in the water or watch you know a black tip reef shark swimming past the camera. So it's a good reminder of what's out there and what's worth conserving. And Maggie, what, what kind of things, like you, you were talking about how you want to give people hope when you're talking about these issues and things that they can do. What kind of things do you tell people that they can do to make the environment better? What are your steps and solutions? Um, well, one of the things that, um, that a constant refrain of mine, again, like the fact that people are talking about this issue on, a, on 7 p.m. on a random Thursday night in the midst of a pandemic, I mean, that gives me hope, right? Like there are people... Thank you all for spending some of your some of your time with us. I, I think the fact that there's a lot of interest and people want to know what the issue is and they're connecting to the problem and they're starting to understand the role that we all have to play in the solution. The thing that gives me hope specifically, um, that, that gives me some optimism, aside from everybody talking about the plastic pollution issue and the waste crisis and those things, the fact that it's entered the mainstream, um, when you really think about it, the solution is is fairly simple. It doesn't require a lot of technology or new things to event. The solution to the plastic pollution crisis is just to use and make less of it. That's it. We just have to choose to not make so much of it and use so much of it. It's actually beautifully simple. <laughs> and I think that there are more and more people and companies and businesses and communities that are realizing that this this can be done like we can just we can just re rechannel the we, we can redesign the system so that we just use less of it. it 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 doesn't require you know geoengineering just just don't use so much of it that's all hmm. <laughs> well we we have a, a question from a viewer uh, from Margaret. She has a question for you, Jonathan. What is the best way that citizens can push for environmental legislation? Oh, thanks, Margaret. Well, uh, you can start by supporting Senator Udall's Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act by, you know, everybody can write to their 
representatives. I like to recommend that folks, you know, go public and, you know, go on Twitter, on Facebook and letters to the editor because when it's a little bit more public, people are more responsive and you have to kind of push them to, to get these policy changes. And I really appreciate what Maggie said because, you know, so much of what Senator Udall's bill is about reducing, you know, we need to start reducing the amount we're putting out there and the, the amount that we are, you know, reusing it, recycling it and whatnot. And I think that, um, you know, this is an issue that has captured so much imagination across the political spectrum that Republicans and Democrats are all united that we need to do something about pollution and plastic pollution specifically. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's sort of where we start to diverge a little bit because you, know, you see a lot in industry uh, that would uh, take exception with what Maggie and, and we are saying and say, let's ramp up production but then we'll rely on government and taxpayers to collect it, to sort it, and then to fund the recycling. And I mean, that's the, the system we've been trying for a really long time and it hasn't been working. So I would say to the, to the questioner, you know, support this legislation, but also locally. I mean, this legislation is based off of uh, legislation that you can see in policies here in the United States that are happening in you know, local governments, towns, cities, states, and across the world, people are reducing the amount of unnecessary and unrecyclable single-use plastic. They're putting deposit programs on bottles so that, you know, these things get returned after they're used and then recycled. Uh, they're requiring folks to say, okay, if you're going to make a product, make a lot more of that out of recycled content than out of new products. So, um, you know, start locally, start at your local school, your neighborhood, your workplace, you know, start reducing, seeing what you can do to invest in more quality products that are reusable. And, and press for that change, but do so in a very public way. That's not just a phone call or a letter directly to your congressman or, or senator. It's something that, that really gets their attention and calls them out to, to take real action. We have another question from a viewer. This one's for Andy. And it is, are all the shoes made from the actual commercial products? And if so, how did you make them to last, i.e. permanent? Well, uh, they are actually made from from the packages and bags and posters and stuff. Like I said, it's, um, uh, most of it's been pulled out of the waste stream, like the the recycling bins, and they'll last as long as those materials last. I um, I put a curtain up in my studio so the sun doesn't um, cause them to 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 yellow, you know, on the paper because they're all made out of paper. They're not made out of uh, plastic. Um, it's it's boxes and um, and paper paper products. So like like that box of cornflakes in your cabinet, um, it's going to be bright and shiny, but eventually um, the 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 acid in the wood in the pulp uh, that made the paper is going to start to um, start to affect the coloration of it, and and it'll be like eventually I suppose it'll be like uh, like newspapers. Uh, not maybe that extreme, but um, in a way it's kind of a, they're kind of, an, I see the shoes as an extension of the people that wear them and they have a life just like the people do. So uh, I would love to um, have a way to make them permanent, but that just, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, so I guess it's a reflection of, um, of the larger situation. Um, so there, there isn't any way, although I have taken extremely good photographs of them. So we're, um, we've got them recorded that way for posterity. And then we have one final question. Uh, this is, what do you think of the idea that our economy is not compatible with the sustainable environment and that real structural change needs to happen to avoid the worst of climate change? I'll kind of leave that to, to, to any of you who have, a, who have an answer to that. I mean, I'll jump in. I'll say that, you know, I do believe we need structural change. You know, um, we are not incorporating uh, the costs of what we're doing into so much of what we're purchasing or buying or living. And I think that we need that systemic change that, that shows that signal 
that when you're purchasing this good or when you're you know, using this product or whatever, it, it shows more of a life cycle on, on what that cost is gonna to be to the environment, to health, and to all these different things. I'm going to chime in. Um, I, I agree. I think that's a really um, good, a good um, start to that question. It's a big question. I, I do think I want to point out that, you know, there is often a narrative that environmental conservation, environmental, um, you know, environmental conservation is incompatible with economic growth. And that, that is really a false narrative. I think that, you know, the way that the current incentives and, and economics are often structured, as Jonathan pointed out, tend to pit the two against each other. But there are a lot of ways that you can align, you know, economic health with environmental health. And we're seeing some of that in, you know, in more responsible products that, you know, are a way for businesses to grow and to, you know, cultivate consumers, but that are not designed to be disposable or to you know or to create unnecessary waste and so i think that you know there can be there can be jobs created when you put them to work in support of environmental conservation and in support of public health as well um and it's just a matter of figuring out the ways to 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 solve you know one problem by alleviating you know the economic problem and and there's examples of that happening i mean we know now that renewable energy is very competitive and you know it's it's happening in spite of some perverse incentives that exist in our structure um i think the other thing to point out with particularly with waste and recycling and plastic pollution as you as we figure out ways to to solve some of the or to address some of the waste crises and to reduce plastic pollution we're also taking action on the climate issue because most of the plastic that we use, um, most of the, most of everything, all products have a carbon footprint and most of the plastic we use is ultimately a byproduct of fossil fuels, right? And so if we're using less, particularly single use disposable plastic, if there's alternatives for it, you know, we're all, you're, by taking action on that issue, you're also able to take some action on the climate issue. And so, Often, you know, there's win-win situations to be had and people are finding them and, you know, people can choose to, to go in that direction. So I, that, that also gives me hope. Andy, any final thoughts from you? Do you think that the consumerism and environmentalism are compatible? I do. I think it's, um, I think all it requires is a shift in thinking and it's just trying to, um, to, um, uh, plow plow the ground in a different way to open up awareness of it and um and so i i know that it's a lot of people are concerned about it but they just don't quite know how to address it uh, but in my experience we all we we don't want to make the the place that we live in worse we want to make it better if we can it's i think it's it's up to you know smart creative people to come up with ways that make it easier for people to do that and make economic sense to do that so that it's less of an effort and um and makes you feel good i mean this morning when i went out for a run i i picked up a few pieces of litter and it doesn't make a big difference in the big big picture but it made me feel really good to do that and i think when you feel good about something you want to do it again so it's like small steps and if we can get people going in the same direction collectively it leads, you know, in incremental ways to much, much bigger changes. So that's, that's my hope. And I hope these, these shoes help, help with that. <laughs> well, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Jonathan. And I also want to thank Christy and the cultural DC team for putting this together. It was a, it's an important topic and I'm glad we could all talk about it tonight. And thanks to you guys for watching. Yeah. Th thank you all so much for being here. I just want to let people know that um, we have recorded tonight's chat and we're going to put it on the Cultural DC website and we'll also put uh, more information on our website for each of our guests. So if you're interested in learning more about the legislation or more about the work that Maggie is doing at the aquarium uh, in Baltimore and certainly with Andy's upcoming exhibition as well as Hunter's uh, 
wonderful words that I'm sure is, it's going to have a lot to say in the coming months uh, as we head towards elections and other things. So, um, but all of that information will be on our website. And I'm so glad that you all could join us uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day all week, every day. Uh, so thank you. Thank you all.